So the next talk is going to be about dark and murky paths of Nixos. And All right. So let's start. So it's me again. So before we start, I first want to announce a little bit of a contest. The first person to actually package this uh, this uh, thing into Nix packages will win this very hard, uh, ugly hard plastic MSN figurine. Actually, it doesn't no longer works on MSN because MSN is no longer working, but it does work on Linux. So get cracking. So and if you're thinking about adding support for this to Hydra, that's even better. So. Because uh, you know it ha actually has LEDs and it can flap its wings and all that. It's really cool. So if you want to want to be woken up in the middle of the night because your build failed, it's perfect. <laughs> so I've got, I got I got some more of them. So I'm going to talk about the history of NixOS, and this is not necessarily the real history. So some of the facts might have been changed for a dramatic effect, but who cares? So it's all in the past anyway. So a little bit about me. I actually studied computer science at Utrecht University together with uh, Ilko and Rob. And um, my master thesis was NixOS. So I created the very first NixOS. So it's because of me that you are here. <laughs> so it would have happened one way or another anyway, but I just accelerated it. So after that, I drifted away to do other things, mostly uh, first system administration. I used to be on the board of NLURG, the formerly known as the Dutch Unix user group. And then I, dr I got more into legal and licensing. So I was on the core team of gplviolations.org for about seven years. And now I'm uh, having my own consultancy, focusing on open source license compliance, software provenance, and so on. So things about reproducible builds, where software is coming from is still very important in my day-to-day -day job. Because when I actually have to go to court and then show like, okay, well, this is where this particular software came from, then knowing exactly where it came from, how it was built is actually very, very important to me. So, um, about me, so I started using Linux and open source uh, somewhere in 1994, first FreeBSD, and then later, uh, we switched at home, we switched to, to, uh, to Linux in 1995, Slackware. And that was before Windows 95 uh, was released. So I only started using Windows 95 or 98 when it was already a few years old. So in 1996, I started studying at uh, Utrecht University. So Ilko was actually the, one of the first other students that I even talked to, when, so on the first day. So uh, we've known each other for quite a long time. So. Uh, I already had some experience with Linux, FreeBSD, then we got HPUX and IREX. Uh, I can tell you it's nothing like in Jurassic Park. But, uh, so, and then Solaris a year later. And although I've used Linux exclusively for a very long time, I've always been a bit of a, uh, you know, a BSD fanboy, and I have proof. So that's actually Kurt McCusick. So an old Unix guy, super nice guy. If you ever meet, meet him in a, uh, conference, just go talk to him. It's, he knows a lot of stuff about the history of Unix, and he's done so much. That's unbelievable. Anyway, th there were some frustrations. So some friends actually studied physics, and they got really deep into Debian. And I was using uh, HPUX, IREX, um, and other Linux, and FreeBSD at home. And then whenever I said, you know, uh, this problem, how should I? And then their default answer would be up, get install. And that really turned me off. Uh, so that's like, <laughs> come on. And so every conversation ended with up, get install. It's like, okay, bye. And that just, just like, it's, if they wouldn't have done that, I might have been using Debian, but that was like, okay, this is not for me. If this is your attitude, then this is not for me. All right. So through a friend, I got involved in Rock Linux. I'm not sure if anyone here has ever heard of Rock Linux. They, oh, one person. It was a long time ago. So, and I especially uh, worked on the UltraSpark uh, port because admittedly, I was also a bit of a Sun fanboy. But um, that distribution was a built from source thing, much like Gen2, but then a little bit before Gen2. And, uh, maybe not as polished as Gen 2. But uh, it, what attracted me is what it was kind of influenced by the FreeBSD port system that I really liked. 
And uh, in the end, it wasn't a very successful project. Gentoo took their entire market uh, basically overnight. And I just ended up installing uh, Red Hat Linux and later Fedora Core and have stayed um, with that forever since. So around 2002, I took over the uh, management or maybe the mismanagement of a student lab at the university. And I also got very interested in things like portability because of my experience with other operating systems and other architectures as well. So one day a very big pile of old PCs became available and we just decided like, okay, well, these are going to be trashed anyway. So why don't we do anything with it? So we will, I just hold them to the lab, we stack them up, we installed different uh, operating systems on it, and we started to play with build farm software. So the Samba build farm, Tinderbox, also some build farm software from the University of Amsterdam, and I've forgotten the name, I don't even know, no longer know. Do you still know what it, Ilko forgot to? And one test case for us was the Stratego, Stratego XT program transformation tool. So that looked a little bit like that. So the person on, on the right is actually uh, Martin, who was the number, th I think the number three committer to Nix packages. So he hasn't done anything for over a decade, I think, but he, st he, can, he can still be found somewhere in the, in the log. So it's a lot of beige, lots of Dell, taking up a lot of space as well. But this is what we, what we did is uh, we played around. And what we found is that the build form software was suboptimal at best. So uh, some builds would sometimes fail because I did an update of the base system. So some builds, they would run perfectly. Then it's like, okay, there's a security update. I would just install the security update and then the build would fail. And debugging that would just be so <laughs> incredibly hard. Uh, so basically uh, we took the approach like, okay, well, you know, um, don't touch it or it will break. Of course, these machines were connected to the internet, so that's not a, not a good idea. But it was a very useful learning experience for us. I wrote a paper about that that you can still find. I presented it at the UK UEG Linux conference in 2003. So it was in Edinburgh. It was very nice in summer, just at the start of the Fringe Festival, so I got lucky. So around this time, Ilko had already started working on, uh, on Nix, and one of the first use cases being uh, release management for, again, Stratego XT. And I have proof for that. So this is from an old conference where it actually says, release management for Stratego, Stratego XT with Nix. See, I didn't lie. Where he's also talking about stuff that I don't even understand, like, what is it? Software deployment as a memory management? I think that's in your, in your thesis, right? So if you really want to know about what this all means, just read this thesis. So, of course, there was already something before Nix. It was called uh, Mac. So that uh, software never saw an official release, but at one point it did have a Wikipedia page. So I think it's probably uh, been deleted a long time ago. And a little known fact, uh, Bram Molinar from Vim fame, he was also working on a release tool called App, which was uh, sponsored by NLNet. There they are again. And one thing is that I basically, I connected Bram, whom I happened to know at the time, and Ilko, and they just spent a day talking about, I don't even know what you talked about, probably about ideas about the different systems. Uh, you probably know a lot more about that. Or may, you might have forgotten. Mostly forgotten. It was a long time ago. So, when I was uh, looking for an, uh, a, a project for my master thesis, I tried some and failed. And basically, I was looking for something like, okay, well, you know, I really have to finish studying. So, um, what they actually said is, well, why don't you try to build a complete Linux distribution with Nix. And uh, back then, already some work had been done by Elko called Nix, Nix U, which was a quite minimal user mode Linux based distribution. So it wasn't the kernel, it was basically some user land tools that were working. So, Nix so there was actually something before NixOS called Nix U. I think you can still find it in the, in the repositories. I wouldn't uh, recommend trying it, but it's still there. 
But my goal was to go all the way and actually install it onto real hardware, just to make sure, like, okay, can we do this? Will this actually work? Because at that time, we didn't know. So I took Nixio, I expanded on it, uh, because I'm quite a stubborn person, I tried to build things on my Fedora core, and Ilko was using SUSE. And yeah, well, you know, they say, you know, Linux standard base, well, my ass. Like, no way. Uh, there were, were so many differences between those two distributions that it was just painful. Uh, so one of the things was with the C library, I think with the MPTL threading library, that was just a ton of pain. So Fedora took a much different approach to that than SUSE did. And that just caused uh, lots of troubles. So in the end, I convinced Ilko uh, that this was a problem. And then he introduced a statically uh, built environment, and I think that that is still more or less in Nix today, but not in the way we actually made it. So my main contribution there was just to moan a lot, so Ilka would fi would actually attack this problem, and that's usually a very good strategy when when dealing with Ilko. You're just you're just bitch. It takes some time, but then it just fixes it like that. So. I actually added quite a few of the tools there, and then I added uh, most of them. I did the uh, static builds, I added them to the subversion repository, and so on. And um, after that, we just started hacking. So this is a very early engineering note. I still don't know what Ilko was trying to say here, but <laughs> I think it was a little bit about how the store worked. You really have to improve your handwriting. So. After adding enough of the essential tools, we actually uh, got, got it to work and, and got it uh, transferred to, to some real hardware. Uh, so both virtual and real. So we, we had some uh, VMware uh, virtual machines, and we also installed it on a real PC. And we were just happily playing around with it. And then we, thought we were toying around, and then all of a sudden we, we realized, like, OK, well, uh, we forgot to create the bin sh symlink. But most of the tools worked. So at that time, we knew, like, OK, well, a lot of the programs out there actually do not depend on bin sh being present in the system. And it will just work fine without them. So Linux standards base, you don't actually don't need it. At least for most programs, you actually don't need it. So at that point, we knew that this would work, and it gave the uh, the project a major boost, and that made Ilko very happy, as I can show you here. <laughs> now, where is this? Is, this is the worst photo that's in there, but... <laughs> can you see that green stuff there? The SUSE DVDs? <laughs> Ilko exposed. Hmm. So, when then we installed a new build farm uh, with two main machines called Itchy and Scratchy, and also a whole uh, other uh, a whole another pile of machines, so we were in definitely into the Simpsons, as you can tell. So, and um, eventually, those two machines were completely reinstalled with NixOS very early on. I was just a little bit hesitant, but just Ilka just said, "Yeah, we like we're just going to install NixOS on it and just use it on those machines," and that worked really well. And I think those machines ran for how long? Four, four or five years quite a long time, doing lots and lots of builds. So um, it was like this, a little bit uh, tidier, as you can see. So the two ma main uh, build machines were, were up there, and the other ones were just all kinds of other machines that we installed with various operating systems. But eventually, those were all scrapped, and I think that, that we only used the two upper machines. So. I did some more work on, um, on NixOS then. I actually made installation CDs, which I then installed on some of the machines that, that, I, that I showed to you. And I also tried uh, to do some cross-compilation. I had some old uh, Java stations, actually, and with a Spark processor. And uh, what I tried to do is to create uh, a cross-compilation environment with uh, GCC. And that turned out to be incredibly hard. I, I still don't know why. So these days, it's a lot better, but at that, t that point it, uh, in time, it was just impossibly hard to do. I don't know why. Something with the include paths, or that it would uh, have something like the, the um, 
it would try to invoke uh, a previously built compiler for the wrong platform or something and libraries and big mess. So after that, uh, I moved away from NixOS, but I still kept contributing to a few packages for a few years, but I don't think that there's much that survives to this day. I mean, maybe a few brackets here and there that you can still find when using git blame. But you know, I still have some of the pictures. It basically says no pictures. So one, one thing that I can do is actually, uh, so Ilka dug up a old boot session, uh, a, a movie with an old boot session of uh, NixOS in June 2005. So it's June 2005. So if you want to see that, it's very, very bare bones. But So I think this is actually Ilko typing, but yeah, so it was this was this was very, very rough. Not a lot of automation going on there at that point. I'm not sure why Ilko was typing so slow. So one thing that you will notice is at this point we didn't actually uh, yet um, correctly set the path because it said command not find found for ls. So we used echo, which was a dirty <laughs> hack, but it works. So, in, so in, in case you ever wipe your, uh, in, in case you ever wipe your environment. In case you ever wipe your environment, that's actually a good hack. So we didn't, didn't actually set the path uh, back then. I think we were just a few months in here at th this point. So just so you know, wild cards, they don't work. Now it's uh, <laughs> So I think this was this was definitely Ilko typing. <laughs> we eventually we 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 got there. We just had to find the right derivation. <laughs> Now, that was very old school, uh, old school NixOS. So I think that's the, that's the end. All right, so, to wrap up, so technically I started NixOS, but since then uh, it is because of you that it has grown so much. So I want to, I actually want to thank you for putting so much work into it and making it a lot, lot better. So thank you.
Also, of course, we might have some time for some more embarrassing stories. <laughs> if anyone wants to hear. <laughs> Why did you move away from NixOS? I got, a jo uh, I got a job and that didn't involve NixOS. And at that point, I was very, very uh, getting very deeply into the licensing stuff. So I basically didn't have any free time left at all to, to tinker with things. But I still updated a few packages here and there. Any other questions? Uh, I'm curious about this idea of running the activation script from Grub while you're booting. If that was an idea you had from the beginning or something you came up with uh, along the way. This was 14 years ago. I honestly <laughs> don't remember. <laughs> I just needed to get stuff, stuff done, so I, I really don't remember. Fair enough. Are you using NixOS again now? So if, if you actually uh, saw my talk from yesterday, no. I'm, so right now I'm still on Fedora. And that's, uh, so some people are trying to convince me to go back to NixOS. So Rob uh, already tried to, uh, to install it while we were driving here. I just said, well, he said, well, yeah, just give me the laptop. I will install it now. I just said, keep your eyes on the road. It will be <laughs> a lot better. But uh, so yeah, I, I should go back into it. but. First, I have to finish a few other things. First, I need to get some clients off my back. <laughs> um, who was the first other person you convinced to install NixOS other than you two? Oh, it's, uh, actually, in our lab, there were quite a few people, uh, a few people quite eager to uh, to install it. So, I think uh, so. Martin, who was who was there, was all, um, as the number three committer, was also very interested, and a few other people in the lab as well. And I'm not sure how it actually spread. Do, do you still know how it, how it actually spread outside of our lab? Was, was, it, was it through the, uh, probably through Haskell, or some Haskell people, I think? Uh, I really can't remember. Uh, yeah, there were very early contributors like Ludovic, uh, who started Geeks. I uh, don't know when he showed up, 2007 or so? There were, were a few people uh, already using it before, but I think that mostly some, uh, some of the Haskell uh, people at the university, they started to get into it and probably spread the word. Yeah, it's all in the Git logs. <laughs> so I don't probably. remember these things because they're in the logs. <laughs> so as soon as they started using it, they started contributing so then we can find out uh, how it actually went. Uh, I was wondering if you can recall anything from your uh, thesis defense. Like, uh, were well, there so any? So, so, it was, so it was not a PhD uh, thesis, but it was just a master thesis. So uh, I remember basically uh, them saying that it was good enough. So <laughs> that was a that was a good moment. <laughs> so no, no, I actually. Uh, so there was just a few people there, so like a supervisor Ilko and a, a, few, a bunch of others. So no external people. So no, I. Don't really recall anything. Uh oh. <laughs> well, first of all, I can mention that uh, the thesis defense was one week before the 10 year deadline that you had to reach in the Netherlands <laughs> to <laughs> not have to pay okay. back your entire student uh, tuition. Okay, fee. So, so a little uh, bit of history about that. So, mm -hmm. when, when we started, we actually got student loans. And uh, the period to finish it was 10 years, and I finished in nine years and 51 days. 51 weeks, sorry, 51 weeks. So I had one week left. And the other thing is that you were re wearing a sick of it all t shirt. That was the label. <laughs> yep. But that, that was just coincidence because now. <laughs> that, I actually, that, that was not an honest. That means that was. No. <laughs> I was wearing that, I, I think, but uh, that wasn't a conscious decision. <laughs> it's just a band, you know. Oh, 
Hey, uh, what did uh, NixS configuration look like before model system was introduced? What did it look like? Configuration came later. I, I like that answer. Yeah, but so basically it was very bare bones, just what, what you saw. That was it. What, that is what it was like in the early beginning, just uh, finding the right paths in the store and then just doing some stuff. So it was really just a proof of concept. This was some really cool masters and PhD theses that you had over there. Are there any any other uh, theses uh, from from your department uh, that that you remember that were that m are interesting in some way to you personally? So you actually expected me to have uh, read those theses? <laughs> so no, no. So I, I, w I wasn't into that. I was just I was just glad that I had finished everything. I probably wasn't the right person to, to have an academic career. <laughs> uh, have you had anything interesting in the uh, lower level, like uh, unikernel space with people? I know um, HALVM, Galois thing, is, um, works with Nix, but have you had anything else uh, in that lower space? You will have to repeat that question. Unikernels. Unikernels. <laughs> that was the question. So no, the only thing that I actually focused on was just getting Linux to work. Okay. So that is all, uh, all I ever tried. Did you consider making it with FreeBSD instead? No. Not fanboy enough. <laughs> so why not? Uh, I already had done it for Linux, and I think that that with, with FreeBSD, um, the whole um, kernel and user space was much more tightly integrated. So it would have been uh, been a lot more uh, difficult with Linux. The things were, were much more componentized, so that would actually have been easier. Sometimes when packaging packages for Nix packages, uh, we have some questions about licensing, what we can include, how we can link, and so on. Would you be willing to help answer those questions? Um, so we have another week, right? So no, so so there. Uh, so of course, I'm not. A, I'm not a lawyer, so I can actually not give legal advice, especially in certain jurisdictions. I'm not allowed to do that. But I do have uh, thoughts about them. That is as, as far as I can go. But yeah, so uh, licensing and, and, and Nix packages, that's something that um, could be improved. Let me just say that. that I think that there's, there's a lot of stuff that can be improved there. So if anyone is interested in, in tackling that problem, I would be more than happy to help. All right, so did any, anyone manage to package it? No one? Really? <laughs> so I will be here all afternoon, so if you just ma have pa packaged it by then, then you can just uh, come and pick it up. So if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention.